So good evening. Great to see you here tonight. And thanks for joining me for this special edition of Bibliotherapy Live, in which I'm going to be talking about families in literature, which I think is a topic that everyone will have comments on. And I'd love you to tell me who are your favourite families in literature, whether it's because you love them as they're fantastic families that you wish you were in in real life and you wish you could join, or whether they're families that you love to hate and that you find fantastically dysfunctional. So I'm going to look at both of those types of families this evening. And I'm going to be racing through a few books but I would love to know your thoughts too. So don't hesitate to ping me a comment and either send me any thoughts or messages on Facebook or Instagram or by email. If it's by email, my email address is ella at ellabertu.com. I've already got one comment. Thank you, Planty. The Durrells, which actually is one of the books that I was going to mention this evening. I do love The Durrells. It's one of my favourite books, which I read when I was in my teens. And I think that's one of the things that's interesting about families in literature and how they affect us as readers when you read about particular families in your younger days, those families could become templates for your own feelings about family, whether it's because you actually wish you were in that family or you want to run away and join them or you're actually really glad that you're not in that family and you're very happy to be in your own far superior family. So with the Durrells, it is a really fantastic novel, My Family and Other Animals, which is really a memoir. It's not a novel, but it reads like a novel, which is one of the reasons it's so brilliant. And that's all about the young Gerald Durrell going off with his family to Corfu when he is a young boy. I think he went when he was about 10 and he went with his three siblings who were um, two brothers and one sister and his mother, but there was no father. So intriguingly, that's a family which is already missing a vital part. And they actually went to Corfu in order to... Um, escape poverty in Bournemouth really and to go and live somewhere more pleasant and beautiful when they didn't have that much money. Nora, thanks for joining us tonight and you're saying that you worked in the Durrells. Such jealousy. I'm so thrilled to hear that. Okay, you worked on the Durrells in Corfu. That's so exciting and I wish I'd been there. If there's another series, please can I come? Uh, that's one of the best TV adaptations of a book that I've ever seen. I absolutely loved it. And I think it's definitely a book that everyone should read. But I would also say, see the TV programme if you can. And Nora is agreeing, saying it was her favourite job, which I can well imagine. And I only wish that I could have actually lived in Corfu my whole life. Having read that book... It made me want to run away and paddle in the seas of Corfu for the rest of my life and bring up my children on Corfu as well. If only we could all do that, like the lovely Durrells did. So that, I do feel, is a very inspiring book for parents and for children because it has such a great sense of freedom, which is something that many children don't tend to feel so much these days and it's something that one wonders whether during lockdown people felt more or less stuck as children. In some ways they might have felt more free because they had more time, they didn't have to go to school, they had more time with their family, they could probably do hopefully more of their hobbies and more things that they enjoyed doing. But then at the same time, they were also stuck 
in their houses a lot more. But then also they would have had the chance if they were lucky enough to live in a place near to nature to enjoy nature in a way that they probably don't normally. So The Durrells was actually a book that I did think about a lot during lockdown as it is a book that makes you appreciate nature in all its glory. Um, it's a book full of love of animals, love of the wild, love of the freedom of the wild, love of the sea. And I completely agree that it should be a compulsory read for all children. Um, I'm just going to read you a little bit of the book to give you a flavour of quite how gorgeous it is. And I'm going to read a bit from the very beginning when the young Gerald Durrell is just arriving in Corfu for the first time, having escaped cold, grey, Bournemouth, Bournemouth. The sea lifted smooth blue muscles of wave as it stirred in the dawn light and the foam of our wake spread gently behind us like, like a white peacock's tail, glinting with bubbles. The sky was pale and stained with yellow on the eastern horizon. Ahead lay a chocolate brown smudge of land, huddled in mist, with a, th a frill of foam at its base. This was Corfu, and we strained our eyes to make out the exact shapes of the mountains, to discover valleys, peaks, ravines and beaches, but it remained a silhouette. Then suddenly the sun lifted over the horizon and the sky turned the smooth enamelled blue of a jay's eye. The endless, meticulous curves of the sea flamed for an instant and then changed to a deep royal purple flecked with green. The mist lifted in quick, lithe ribbons, and before us lay the island, the mountains as though sleeping beneath a crumpled blanket of brown, the fold stained with the green of olive groves. Along the shore curved beaches as white as tusks, among tottering cities of brilliant gold, red, and white rocks. We rounded to the northern cape, a smooth shoulder of rust-red cliff carved into a series of giant caves. The dark waves lifted our wake and carried it gently towards them, and then at their very mouths it crumpled and hissed thirstily among the rocks. Rounding the cape we left the mountains and the island sloped gently down, blurred with the silver and green iridescence of olives, with here and there an admonishing finger of black cypress against the sky. The shallow sea in the bays was butterfly blue, and even above the sound of the ship's engines, we could hear, faintly ringing from the shore like a chorus of tiny voices, the shrill, triumphant cries of the cicadas. A lot of people are commenting on here that it's one of their favourite books, and I think quite a few of you probably did read it in your childhood and teens. And I think anyone that hasn't read it yet read it now it's such a beautiful book it's really inspiring it makes you want to look after the natural world it makes you want to go and live in nature if possible on a greek island but we can't all do that it makes you want to be able to let your kids roam free if you have children and it's very much a book about family and it's all about embracing eccentricity i would say so the young gerald is a fanatic collector of animals and his brother Lawrence becomes a very important and famous writer. Um, he's also got his brother Leslie who's kind of an eccentric hunting, shooting, fishing type of kid and there's his sister Margot who just really does her own thing. And they're all unique, brilliant, unusual characters. They all go their own directions. And the wonderful thing about the book is that it makes you feel that eccentricity should be embraced and indeed encouraged. And um, Gerald Durrell's mother is quite a quiet presence in the book, really, as she is in the TV adaptation but she's also a quietly strong character and she's the glue that holds everyone together in that family. So that's one of the first books that comes to mind when people think about 
favourite novels about their families. Um, and I'd love people to keep sending in other comments about books that they have loved as uh, novels that make them think about the experience of being in a family. One of the ones that I'd love to talk about on a rather different style is a book which is far less positive in its family kind of vibe. It is I, Claudius and Claudius the God by Robert Graves. Um, now these are really excellent novels, still incredibly readable, I have to say even though um, Robert Graves can seem a little bit old fashioned, but I've been rereading some of this today and absolutely loving it and getting completely gripped once again. And these books are completely based around the dynasty of the Roman emperors and they explore the evils really of the Roman emperors and what they did to each other and how they killed each other off constantly, poisoning, executing, burning and really having absolutely no sympathy with each other. So you couldn't get further away from the Durrells if you tried. I, Claudius, the first of these two books is a book that spans the reign of Claudius, who was the fourth emperor of the Roman Empire from AD 41 to 54. He was the grandson of Mark Antony, if that helps, and the great nephew of Augustus. And he was kept out of public life initially because he stammered and stuttered and he was incredibly shy and he also limped and he was generally seen as a complete dud of the family and he had quite a lot of nervous tics. Poor boy. Uh, nowadays he would have had a lot of help from his family uh, in most societies but in the Roman times he was kept well out of sight and whenever he did go into the public eye he always caused a massive disaster. Nora, I would say definitely read it now if you haven't read it yet. It's actually one of the most gripping books I've ever read. And because lots of it will be slightly familiar to you in terms of Roman history, it's all the more fun. Though it must be pointed out that it is very heavily fictionalised. Robert Graves did get lots of his ideas from Suetonius, who wrote the lives of the great emperors and it's it's very much based on truth so all the people that die are obviously um they really did die in those ways that he describes but the internal life of claudius is of course completely made up uh it's brilliantly written though to the point where you do feel really tangibly as if you're there and claudius himself is a highly sympathetic character we really root for him because from the start he is picked on and seemingly hated by the rest of his family and the joy is that he actually does succeed and eventually become emperor himself in a way because nobody could really take him seriously and everyone else in the family has been killed off by the time he comes to power. And he doesn't come to power until he's in his 50s because he starts off being a historian, being an academic, writing about his own family while his aunt is killing off all the rest of his family one by one by using poison and various other methods. Um, and Claudius is a really great hero of this novel because he observes, he sits and watches and has a lot of his own dark thoughts while other people are being killed off around him. I'm going to read you a little bit of this to give you a flavour of it too. And the bit I'm choosing to read for you gives you an idea, I think, of why it still feels so contemporary and so very um relatable to us now 
And I think the clever thing about Robert Graves is that he pretended to be Claudius himself writing the book so that it would be found 2000 years later by us. And you actually believe that that's what's happened when you pick up the book and read it. So I'll just read you a little bit. Uh, it is quite a big book, as you can see. This is a confidential history, but who, it may be asked, are my confidants? My answer is, it is addressed to posterity. I do not mean my great-grandchildren or my great-great-grandchildren. I mean an extremely remote posterity. Yet, my hope is that you, my eventual readers of a hundred generations ahead or more, will feel yourselves directly spoken to, as if by a contemporary. As often Herodotus and Thucydides, long dead, seem to speak to me. And why do I specify so extremely remote a posterity as that? I shall explain. I went to Cumae in Campania a little less than 18 years ago and visited the Sibyl in her cliff cavern on Mount Gaurus. There is always a Sibyl at Cumae, for when one dies, her novice attendant succeeds, but they are not all equally famous. Some of them are never granted a prophecy by Apollo in all the long years of their service. Others prophesy indeed, but seem more inspired by Bacchus than by Apollo, the drunken nonsense they deliver, which has brought the oracle into discredit. Before the succession of Dephobi, whom Augustus often consulted, and Amalthea, who was still alive and most famous, there had been a run of very poor Sibyls for nearly 300 years. The cavern lies behind a pretty little Greek temple, sacred to Apollo and Artemis. Cumae was an Aeolian Greek colony. There is an ancient gilt frieze above the portico ascribed to Daedalus. Though this is patently absurd, for it is no older than 500 years, if as old as that, and Daedalus lived at least 1,000 years ago. It represents the story of Theseus and the Minotaur, whom he killed in the labyrinth of Crete. Before being permitted to visit the Sibyl, I had to sacrifice a bullock and a ewe there to Apollo and Artemis, respectively. It was cold December weather. The cavern was a terrifying place, hollowed out from the solid rock. The approach steep, tortuous, pitch dark and full of bats. I went disguised, but the Sibyl knew me. It must have been my stammer that betrayed me. I stammered badly as a child, and though by following the advice of specialists in elocution, I gradually learned to control my speech on set public occasions. Yet on private and unpremeditated ones, I am still, though less so than formerly, liable every now and then to trip nervously over my own tongue, which is what happened to me at Cumae. I won't uh, go on, although it actually is totally gripping, particularly this scene, and we do hear Claudius stuttering away. And actually what's quite funny is the Sybil, who is meant to be a kind of divine creature, takes the mickey out of him and starts stuttering back at him. That's what I love about the book. He makes everyone in it incredibly human and believable. And you even sympathise with the horrible Livia, his aunt, who is the one that keeps poisoning people uh, with mushrooms quite often. And Caligula stars in the book. And Caligula's, Calig Caligula is always uh, a great character in any novel or film. So do read it. I don't normally say this, but I would actually advise you not to listen to the audiobook because for some reason, when I tried the audiobook, I found it really off putting. I think it's read in a very kind of over the top, slightly pompous tone. So I would much more recommend reading it than listening to the book. I'm now going to move on from ancient Rome to something far more modern to discuss. Um, in fact, before I bring in this book, I just must mention to you one of my favourite families in literature, which I'm sure lots of you readers uh, that I know from bibliotherapy sessions and as friends and regulars on here will know. The Moomins, 
the Moomins are probably one of the best families in the whole of literature, especially children's literature, but also they're fantastic for adults. And I do talk about them very regularly. But to me, they are the ideal family. And really, we all want to be Moomins. But I won't go on about them to excess tonight because I have talked about them many times before. You haven't read the Moomins, Nora. This is definitely a terrible omission in your life. You must read them immediately. So you've got I, Claudius, Robert Graves and Tove Janssen on your list immediately. I don't know if I'm holding this up the right way. Sorry. Um, start with Finn, Family, Moom and Troll and carry on. You will find them, I believe, probably some of the best stories that you've ever read. And they're incredibly relatable. They're by no means just for children. They're actually really fantastic for adults as well because they actually deal with many issues that adults deal with. They have depression, loneliness, OCD behaviour, all kinds of quirks and eccentricities, but all in the guise of woodland creatures. And they're very funny and just generally they are great. Um, so moving on to adult books again. Uh, this, I don't have the real book with me because I did listen to this one on audio. Uh, so I'm just holding up a representation of the cover. The Most Fun We Ever Had by Claire Lombardo, which is a fantastic novel, which is getting a lot of attention at the moment. It's actually going to be made into a TV series with all kinds of fabulous stars in it, including Renee Zellweger and many more brilliant people. Um, this is a book which I love and think is fantastic in terms of family because it describes a big family over a period of about 20 years. It sort of goes back and forth quite a lot. But the wonderful and lovely thing about the book is the parents have a really loving relationship. They fall in love in 1974 and the book takes us to 2016. They have four daughters, Violet, Grace, Wendy and Liza. And they are, as a couple, almost too in love to the point where their children find them almost too wonderful an example to live up to. And they are represented in a very beautiful and inspiring way as a couple, which makes you actually really reassess your own relationship if you're in one, thinking, I must be more like them. The parents are Marilyn and David Sorensen, and they're really lovely people and they really care for each other and they really look after each other and their children and the four children actually do have quite complicated issues they're by no means a totally happy and uncomplicated family which is what makes the book uh fun and gripping and really enjoyable to read because we go through their various traumas as we go back and forth in time. So we see the parents, Marilyn and David, meeting, and then we flip back and forth from 2016, where there's various dramas occurring, back to the events of their childhood. And there's one very big event, which is, I don't want to give away too much, but one of the daughters has a child herself, when she's only very young. I think she's probably about 17 or 18. And she gives up that child to, for adoption. But, of course, the child comes back and re-enters the scene and causes a huge amount of um, controversy within this family, which had seemed to be very settled and very affluent and very unruffled but then this child reappears 17 years later and causes enormous ripples of discontent 
not least to his own mother. And he is actually a really fantastic character who I thought was one of the best characters in the book. But all of them are really excellent characters. It's a debut novel by Claire Lombardo, who is also a creative writing teacher. This book that I'm talking about um, is called The Most Fun We Ever Had by Claire Lombardo. And it is genuinely a fantastic read, full of great wisdom and full of very interesting thoughts about families and what makes them tick, what makes them positive or negative, and what makes people work well as a family and what helps people to survive within a family. I'll just read you a couple of quotes from the book to give you a sense of some of the things I loved about it. The thing that nobody warned you about adulthood was the number of decisions you'd have to make, the number of times you'd have to depend on an unreliable gut to point you in the right direction, the number of times you'd still feel like an eight-year-old waiting for your parents to step in and save you from peril. That might be that something, something that quite a lot of us adults can relate to. Here's another one. Nobody's ever prepared to care for a child full time is what I mean. Nobody understands what that means until they do it for themselves. We're all just holding our breath and hoping nothing catastrophic happens. And how deeply you get hurt doing that is constant pain. It's a parade of complete and utter agony all the time, forever. That's one of the characters. She's uh, quite negative but then there's also lots of very positive and lovely thoughts about being a family and about having children and about children growing up uh, so one more quote from the most fun we ever had and there was something indescribably lovely about this the baby who'd once jabbed with restless knees at your internal organs sitting beside you on a park bench and benevolently giving you shit. And it occurred to her that it was moments like these that made being alive feel worth it. Little blips of contentment amid the mayhem and status quo. So that's a really good read, the most fun we ever had, uh, which I thoroughly recommend as an excellent modern American novel all about families and what makes them survive. And it really is one of the most gorgeous evocations of long-term love that I've ever read. Um, I am then going to move on to something very much contrasting from that. I just want to briefly mention this book that some of you might know by A.M. Holmes, May We Be Forgiven, which is I would say the complete opposite of the most fun we ever had. It's another fantastic book, which I absolutely loved, but it's really very dark and it talks about many of the negative sides of being in a family. It's about two brothers who are in constant rivalry for, since the day that they were born and the very beginning of the book is a terrible disaster which is sparked by an adulterous kiss but having said that with all its darkness this is a book full also of positive energy and love in families and the reason I love it is that it has some very alternative families in it there's lots of people being adopted there's lots of people forging their own families who are not actually related by blood. And that's another theme in literature, which is common to both adult and children's books. And A.M. Holmes very brilliantly talks about that in May We Be Forgiven, which is quite a roller coaster ride of a read. And I'd very much recommend it to all of you. Um, now, the book that I was going to mention, which is a big contrast also to the most fun we ever had is Sarah Crossan's recent book called Here is the Beehive 
as you can see, it's very beautifully made. It's a lovely cover. And Sarah Crossan is a young adult writer, mainly, who many of you might know from her books. She wrote a book called One, which is about conjoined twins, which is a really beautiful book for young adults. Um, and that's the first one of hers that I read personally. And she's also written several other young adult books, such as Breathe, which is also an excellent book, a bit more of a dystopian type novel. And this is Sarah Crossan's first adult novel. Now, one of the things that makes her unique and brilliant as a writer is that she writes in poetry. Um, and I actually didn't realise that when I first read her book one, because I was listening to it on audio. And although it was a book that I realised was poetically beautiful and brilliant, I hadn't realised that when you look at it on the page, it's also written in verse. Um, but the fact that I didn't realise it is an indication, I think, of how subtle and beautifully done it is, how beautifully she writes, because she writes in a very um, chatty and conversational style, but it is also poetry. Um, now, this is a book which is actually deeply unlike any of her other books because it's also quite negative in some ways. It's about an affair and it's about the death of a man who is in a marriage who the narrator is having an affair with, if that makes sense. So the narrator is at the very beginning talking about her relationship with this man and she almost immediately gets a phone call from the man's wife saying that he's just died and that that begins the novel and it's completely gripping it's a very compelling read it is quite bitter seeming it's got a lot of dark feelings in it which is very also unlike the other books of Sarah Crossan's that I've read. But having said that, it's very beautiful and very compelling and very powerful and full of incredible imagery. So it is a book that I'm really happy to have read and want to keep going back to reread because it's so multi-layered and has so much going on in it and actually one of the things that is an indication of how deeply layered it is is that the author the narrator at the beginning tells us that she is not going to do anything until she's read Anna Karenina twice and Anna Karenina is a book that's very closely related to this one um, I'm going to read you just one passage to give you an indication of what it's like to read it. And I would very much recommend you try it, as well as Sarah Crossan's other books, because I think she is such a fantastic writer. Um, I'm just trying to find you the best passage to read, because it's quite uh, powerful stuff. Okay, here we go. This is a section where the narrator is looking at another um, another flat that she wants to rent. I didn't mention, by the way, that the narrator herself is married. So she's married and has two children and she is having an affair with this other man. And during the course of the novel, she is very much on the verge of leaving her two children, just like Anna Karenina. So it is a very interesting and uh, in a way quite worrying book. Anyway, here's a little section. The agent, a girl no older than 20, pushes open the door and curls a nostril. They must have pets, she says. The mat is littered in mail, more discarded behind the door, along with a broken umbrella, a toolbox, and two grey cats do appear, 
bony and matted. So it's 2200 per month, three bed, one bath, six month minimum lease. The agent leads me into the kitchen. Saucepans are piled high in the sink. The surface of the dining table is invisible beneath a mess of oil paints and monochrome canvases. Not bad really for the price. This area can get silly. I live close by, I explain, wondering why I'm trying to impress this child. Are you renovating? No, I'm separating. I'm looking for a place for myself and my new partner. He has three boys. I have a girl and a boy. Right, she's distracted by the smell, isn't attending to my lies. But I continue as she leads me upstairs into bedrooms with bedsheets for curtains. I guess we're a typical blended family. His ex isn't completely on board, but these things take time. Main focus is the kids now and retaining my dignity. Uh-huh. So I'm showing someone else the house later. If you're interested, you'll need financial references and to let me know as soon as. The plug hole in the shower is caked in hair. Bile rises in my throat. It's a shithole, I say. I'm not interested, but call me if anything better becomes available. Ruth and John will be asleep already. Paul will be scrubbing pans. And I am here, trying to torpedo them all. This family I have made. So that is a more dark look at family life, but I think it's a good one to bring in as a contrast to some of the more positive looks at families that we have in this evening of bibliotherapy, because not all families are happy families, let's face it. Um, there's many more books that I want to mention, and I'm aware that I'm not going to have time for all of them. Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng, probably pronouncing her name wrong. That might be a TV series that some of you have watched during lockdown. It was on Netflix and it was utterly gripping. It's a rare book that I must say I read for the first time and didn't completely fall in love with. Then I watched the TV programme and was absolutely gripped and fell in love with it. So I reread the book and found it so much more compelling. Has anyone else had that experience, either with Little Fires Everywhere or with any other book? I'd be really interested to know because I almost always tell people that they should definitely read a book before they see any kind of film or TV adaptation. In fact, I always tell them that. But perhaps there are very rare occasions where it can be better to see the film or TV series first. I would love your thoughts. Just going to have a little sip of some Diet Coke. While you ponder that thought. Um, little Fires Everywhere is a novel all about motherhood. It's a really, really intriguing novel with many multi layers of motherhood in it. There's surrogate motherhood. That's one of the key aspects of the book. There is a conventional motherhood of a conventional family. There's adoption and there's all those aspects of motherhood combined and it's a really brilliantly intriguing and well plotted novel which is definitely one that I appreciated all the more. Uh, for people that are just joining I'm talking about Little Fires Everywhere which I appreciated all the more after seeing the TV series which I did think was a really fantastic adaptation on Netflix. It's got some brilliant characters in it who are, um, there's a teenager called Izzy, who is my favourite character. Um, there's Mia Warren, who's an artist, who is it, the mother who has adopted a child. I'm getting into deep water that I might give things away, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. But it's another great book that I would very much recommend to people if you haven't read it already. And Colleen, thanks for your comment that you like to read the book first. Me too, every time. 
but maybe very occasionally it might work the other way around. And I'd love to know anyone that has had that experience. Um, now, there's a couple of other books that I really want to talk about before the evening is gone. And one of them is this, Local Souls by Alan Garganus, which is a book that I picked up very randomly in a charity shop in Penzance. And to my great shame, I had never heard of Alan Garganus, who turns out to be a Pulitzer Prize winning, amazing novelist. And I feel shocked and horrified that I'd never read him before. But um, maybe there's some of you out there too who haven't read him yet. His most famous and successful book is Oldest Living Confederate Tells All. I think that's the full title, uh, which I haven't actually read yet. Um, but this is three novellas put together and they make a whole novel. Um, what I love about Alan Garganus, and I'm now pretty obsessed with him and I'm going to read everything he's ever written, is the way he writes his sentences. They're really beautiful and incredibly compelling. And the way that he builds a story. And at first you might be thinking, I don't really know what's going on. But as the story goes on, you become utterly gripped. You just can't put the book down. And you are eventually, generally given quite an enormous shock by the end of the story. And this is one of those books that has given me one of the biggest jolts in literature that I've ever had. A little bit akin to the book uh, We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves by Karen Joy Fowler, which is another amazing book, which we'll talk about another time. But going back to picking up this book in Penzance, it's a cover that made me think it might be quite a light and trashy novel because the guy surfing is quite a cheesy kind of character. But when you read the story, you realise that that is a very ironic picture because the first story in the book, which is called Fear Not, is about a girl who becomes known as Fear Not because when she's very small and on stage in a Christmas carol, she very loudly says, Fear Not! Uh, because she's an angel in the Advent scene. So she's henceforth always known as Fear Not. And this is her dad who is on the water skis. And he, at the beginning of the story, has a terrible accident, which I won't go into detail of, but it completely puts you off water skiing forevermore. Anyone that's water skiing, be super careful because the accident described in here is very grim indeed. But th that happens at the start of the story. And the rest of the story is the aftermath of that terrible accident, which happens to Fear Not's father. And believe me, it's one of the best and most surprising stories that I've read in a very long time. When I say story, it's really a novella more than a story. Um, the second one in this collection is called Saints Have Mothers, and that's a really superb story also uh, called Saints Have Mothers. Hi, Anthony. I don't know if I was pronouncing that right, but thanks for your uh, note of encouragement there. So anyway, um, Saints Have Mothers is a really another really surprising story, which is one that I found equally, if not even more brilliant than the first in this collection, which is Fear Not. Saints Have Mothers is about a girl in this same community in North Carolina that all of these stories are set in, who is a kind of modern day saint. She's so saintly that she gives away everything that she owns in her house and not only does she give away her own possessions but she gives away her mother's possessions she gives away all her mother's shoes she gives away all of their money 
And then she goes off to Africa to try and help local communities there. And the story is written in the voice of the mother. And it's brilliantly caustic and kind of shocking the way that Alan Garganus describes her persona. And I'm going to read you a little bit of it, which will give you a sense of what she's like. Now, it's not giving away too much to reveal that um, about a third of the way through the story, the daughter, who is the saint, drowns in Africa um, because there's a lot more that happens after that. So here we are. This is the voice of the mother. On learning of my child's drowning, I had not, as I stated, managed to weep. Unlike my newly sensitive ex-husband, who these days, as an adopted Californian married to philosophy's own Tiffany, can grow misty-eyed over anything, including a Niçoise salad, if it is tossed sufficiently beautifully, Shelbourne too, come to think of it, is a veritable Trevi fountain. I know it's one of feminism's gains, but somebody should maybe tell these guys when it comes to men and sobbing. Less is more. Once, twice per male lifetime. Father's death. Mum's. One really good dog's. Otherwise, put a sock in it. Sorry, I should really be doing that in an American accent, but my accents are not brilliant. I just love the voice of the mother because she is actually such an unpleasant person. Uh, it's quite a joy to read her. And I just find her hilarious when she's talking about men and sobbing once, twice per male lifetime. That's all that uh, that's allowed men, any men that are with me tonight. You're not allowed to cry, according to this woman, more than twice in your lifetime. Maybe for your father's or your mum's death or a really good dog's. Otherwise, put a sock in it. So I don't know if that gives a good uh, sense of the amazing writing of Alan Gerganus, but believe me that he's a really excellent writer. Give him a go. I think he's an amazing discovery for me. And I love this whole community that he builds up in North Carolina around a fictional area called Falls, which is full of really fantastic characters. And all of them have these deep, dark stories which are slowly revealed. And that's what he's brilliant at, um, showing us the slow reveal. And so far, with all the stories I've read of his, he's completely taken me by surprise every time, which I do think is an amazing art and very much something uh, to aspire to as a reader and a writer. Um, so other books that I would love to mention relating to the joy of families, knowing that time is very much running out, are a less common uh, family unit, which is in this gorgeous book by Sebastian Barry, Days Without End. I so recommend reading Sebastian Barry. He's one of my favourite writers. You can read all of his novels and get completely swept away by them. And this is one of a series which talk about the McNulty family. This novel is set in the 1850s and it's about two boys who are only just 17 who sign up to join the um, American army in the Civil War and they get swept into various battles which they really don't understand or have any clue about. And what is beautiful and amazing about the book is the relationship between these two guys. The um, young boys meet when they're 17 and fall in love with each other John Cole is known throughout the book as Handsome John Cole. And in my mind, he's rugged and gorgeous. Thomas McNulty is his partner. And this is the 1850s. So being gay was not something that was uh, widely recognised or accepted. But 
these two boys get up to really fantastic japes. They also go through a lot of hideous pain and horror, but they survive and they go through 400 pages, I think, of drama. And one of the most lovely things about the novel is the little family unit that they managed to create with an Indian girl who they adopt. And I don't think I'm giving too much away here, but it's such a romantic story. It's one that gives you a lot of heart and joy in a different kind of family. Being set in the 1850s, maybe it was unlikely that that kind of gay relationship would really survive. But they do, the two boys do keep it under wraps most of the time successfully. And they manage to go through a lot of near discovery and near death experiences. But it's really such a romantic read, I would say. It's a compulsory read in your search for books that are all about families. There's two other books I just want to touch on before we end, which are excellent books for thinking about grandparents and the effect of grandparents on their grandchildren uh, and also aging parents generally. So Jonathan Franzen's The Corrections is a brilliantly hilarious and often quite grim but wonderful description of a family kind of disintegrating as their parents are getting too old and the father has dementia and is kind of losing his marbles. The mother is getting addicted to a strange prescription drug called Aslan and they are obsessed as a unit with getting their kids home for the Christmas holidays. And the book is all about the slow trajectory as they come towards the Christmas holidays. And they're three kids who are all adults who all for their different reasons don't really want to come home for the holidays. And it's very funny, very sympathetic and very sad, but one that I would really suggest that you read if you haven't. And it's also brilliant on audio. Um, a great combination book to read with that one is Rohinton Mysteries Family Matters, which is a novel about another old man who is reaching the end of his life in Bombay, Mumbai, and he is a 79-year-old widower who's being looked after by various of his stepchildren. And it's an incredibly compassionate, lovely, beautiful book about this poor old, poor old man being shuttled from pillar to post from one family to the next, knowing that he's a burden to his family and trying not to be a burden. And at the same time, just wanting some humanity and respect from his children. And some of his children are more lovely to him than others. It's a very inspiring book actually because it does make you think about how you would look after your own parents. Some of you might be in the position of looking after your parents already and what kind of care you would give them. Um, and it's it's one that makes you really think, are we so different here? Would we be different if we were in an Indian family, should we be bringing in our parents to live with us rather than sending them off to live in a care home? It's a book that makes you really think about your your own relationships with your elderly parents and relatives. And it's a very profound and gorgeous book about families in general. So I would very much recommend that. So on that note, I think I better come to an end, but it's really lovely to see you all here tonight. Thank you for coming and joining me. If anyone's got any other books that they'd like to mention relating to families, please do send me a message on Facebook or Instagram or on my email, ella at ellabertu.com. I'd love to know 
any of your thoughts about children's books, which had a profound influence on you when you're thinking about families and how they might have made you have a different template for your own family, like the Durrells did with me, because I obviously now live in the wild with hundreds of animals. Uh, I wish I did. And I aspire to that. Uh, and next week, I will be talking about quiet literature. So I'd love you to come and join me if you would like to think about that too. What makes quiet literature wonderful to experience? Why do we read it? What are the best quiet books that you've ever read? So that's a very different kind of topic. And then the week after that, I'll be on the Damien Barr Literary Salon page talking about reading the outdoors. So we'll be going back into the outdoor world. So thanks so much for coming. Have a great evening and see you next week. Bye.